Good evening. I'm Carlos Moore, the president-elect of the National Bar Association. It's my great privilege and honor to bring you greetings this evening on behalf of our 78th president, C.K. Hoffler, who could not be with us on this evening. We're so happy to have this very timely discussion about um, police brutality and basically a report card. Where are we now in the aftermath of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and the names go on and on. I was very elated uh, to see that Derek, Derek Chauvin was held accountable on last Tuesday when the jury returned a verdict of guilty, guilty, guilty. But of course, that was not justice. True justice would be George Floyd still been alive with us, but yet and still he died after having his neck uh, compressed for nine minutes and 29 seconds for being suspected, suspected of uh, passing a counterfeit bill. And so in America, black men continue to be killed, uh, sometimes with impunity for something so simple. Uh, Dante Wright, suspected of dangling air freshener from his rearview mirror. And then they tried to say he had an expired tag both simple misdemeanors that should not have resulted in a death sentence. He's dead and gone now at the hand of police. And so we are going to discuss, have a very timely discussion uh, on this evening about uh, where we go from here. Uh, it is very evident that something has to be done. As a civil rights lawyer with the Cochran firm founded by the legendary Johnny Cochran, I'm happy and excited about taking the helm of the National Bar Association in just 90 days from today on July the 29th. And during my tenure at the helm of the National Bar Association, we plan to be tenacious and relentless in our pursuit of justice. Something has to give, uh, as Fannie Lou Hamer once said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. They would not continue to kill us. They would not continue to kill us with impunity. We are gonna take a stand and we're gonna be strong, tenacious advocates for justice during my tenure uh, as president of the National Bar Association. And so my hat's off to the conveners of this uh, forum on this evening, Elijah Ford, who's region three director for the National Bar Association and her esteemed colleague who will serve as my chief, of, my chief policy advisor and the parliamentarian of the National Bar Association for the next bar year, Alicia Hughes. So again, welcome. Uh, and I look forward to a hearty discussion on this evening. Thanks to each of the panelists and to the University of Miami. Uh, for convening us. Thank you very much and good evening. The term police brutality uh, is commonly used in the United States is the excessive and unwarranted use of force by law enforcement. It is an extreme form of police misconduct and a civil rights violation. In the United States, major political and social movements have arisen out of these incidents and even those movements are almost always met with excess additional excessive force by police officers. Uh, these movements include the civil rights movement of the 1960s, the anti-war and anti-poverty demonstrations in the 1970s, challenges to over-policing and the war on drugs in the 1980s and 90s, and most recently, the Black Lives Matter movement. And so here we are in 2021, confronting the same issues that have plagued this country for centuries. And tonight we gather to ask the question, where are we after the most recent onslaught of unfortunate and unlawful police encounters? And it is my pleasure to serve as a moderator this evening um, on the topic of the family and community experience, uh, the people who are most directly affected by police misconduct and uh, brutality. And I would ask that the panelists please turn their cameras on and, and introduce themselves. I am the moderator and I'm trying to be only that because we have a dynamic uh, slate of speakers, lawyers, justice pursuers, and just great leaders in our community. Um, and so if we could start with uh, Judge Johnson, uh, I, I would like for you to introduce yourself and also provide some context for the families and the communities that you encountered in this context. Uh, we shouldn't assume that everyone who's here tonight is familiar with these incidents, uh, though I believe many of them are, but I, I would like for you to provide a little bit of context when you introduce yourself. So Judge Johnson, will you please start? Well, thank you, Christopher. I appreciate you. And I appreciate the National Law Association for allowing me to be a part of this panel. Um, uh, I am right now I'm a, uh, 
a partner in the law firm, Stanton LLP. And uh, before that, you all may remember, I was actually appointed as the uh, Dallas County District Attorney. I served for two years. And before that, I was actually a judge. So that's why you all still call me Judge Johnson. I was a criminal just district judge and have been a prosecutor uh, before that. Uh, I had the unfortunate, and I, I call it unfortunate because as you just said, it's, 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 it's bad that you know, people lose their lives because of simple things or just lose it altogether. And I was the uh, prosecutor, the DA at the time that actually uh, worked very hard to get the indictment in the uh, both in John's case uh, against Amber Geiger. And that just sent uh, waves throughout the whole world, not just the United States, but throughout the whole world. And I think the key in that particular case, and although the community was, they were, they were, they, they were uh, pushing for all kinds of things, mainly for a murder indictment, and they were concerned that she was not uh, originally arrested for murder. And, uh, and at the time, people didn't understand that uh, the DA didn't, didn't deal with the original arrest, but we had a whole lot to do with the indictment. And I constantly assured the people, we will get an indictment because I knew the facts and I was strongly involved in that. So uh, because of that, uh, we did, and all the work we did in that case, we were able to get an indictment. And of course, I was no longer the DA once the case went to trial and she was eventually convicted. Uh, and, I, and, and of course, a lot of people concerned because the case is on appeal. And and I think just even recently they had oral arguments in terms of her appeal. So um, that's why I'm here today to bring some light on this issue. And I think one of the biggest concerns is that you have people in leadership who's willing to do the right thing. And I was committed to making certain that justice was done. And that's the key to it all. You having people at the top, you having people at the bottom, you having the right people in the police department and police officers because we won't be able to rid ourselves of any of this unless we have all those factors playing at the same time. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Attorney Holmes, uh, would you please introduce yourself to the, to the group? Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Joyette Holmes, currently a partner in the law firm of Gregory Doyle, Calhoun and Rogers. I formerly served as the chief magistrate judge and then the district attorney in Cobb County, Georgia. Uh, I was the prosecutor who was specially assigned to the Ahmaud Aubrey case, who was gunned down in Brunswick, Georgia in February of 2020 by a father and son, Greg and Travis McMichael, and their neighbor, William Roddy Bryant. We were able to bring the indictment against the three of them, um, led the arrest of the third defendant, the Father and son had been arrested right before our office's appointment in that case. That case is uh, still ongoing, uh, going through motions hearings, and I understand uh, the trial is likely slated for October and November of this year. Yesterday, exciting news about that case came out and that the United States Department of Justice also indicted the three defendants on federal hate crime laws. While I'm no longer the prosecutor in that case, I'm not the district attorney in Cobb County anymore. Still very vested um, in um, being a supporter of making sure that justice happens in that case. Thank you very much. Uh, attorney Lamar. Good evening, everyone. I'm attorney B.I.B. Lamar. Um, I represent uh, the families of uh, well, Jacob Blake and also uh, Joel Acevedo among um, many other uh, police brutality cases um, out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, where I'm originally a native. Um, I want to first thank uh, the National Bar Association for having this event. Um, it's a, I want to thank the University of Miami. I want to thank President-elect Carlos Moore um, and, and esteemed panelists um, for participating in such a, a, a very important discussion um, as it relates, relates to reform in our policing. Um, obviously, this month has been a very historic month uh, for civil rights. Um, one of the cases, obviously, with Jacob Blake brought national attention back in August, uh, where Jacob Blake was uh, shot at by Officer Shesky seven times while he was simply walking away from an officer. 
um, that begs um, an important question as we see in many of these cases uh, regarding uh, qualified immunity, um, prosecution of officers, um, the body cam issues, uh, which we see time and time again. So I, again, I look forward to um, that aspect of our discussion, um, especially in light of the recent um, case out in uh, North Carolina with Andrew Brown. Um, the Joel Acevedo case that I also um, am co-counsel along with um, Ben Crump um, is very similar in nature to the George Floyd case. Um, it was a um, individual who was choked for 11 minutes and 20 seconds and it occurred April um, about a month before George Floyd last year. Now that case has not gotten the attention um, nationally um, as it deserves at this time because of the blockage of the body cam footage. So again, that's an important issue um, that I'm looking forward to discussing. Um, but again, um, shining a light on these issues, um, highlighting reforms is definitely um, the first steps that we need to take. And I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you, uh, Attorney J. Wendell Gordon. Please introduce yourself to the, uh, the Good evening, everybody. My name is Jay Wendell Gordon. I'm an attorney uh, in the great state of Maryland. Uh, I practiced law for about 26 years. I practice all manner of law, including um, uh, criminal and um, civil. And I've been kind of drafted into this civil rights work because of all of the uh, all the tragedies that have occurred, uh, not only in my state but across the country. I recently represented Corinne Gaines, a young lady who was uh, 23 years old. She was shot and killed by Baltimore County Corporal Royce Ruby while she was in the kitchen uh, making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for her five-year-old son, who was also shot and injured by police. Um, that case resulted from a standoff with police early morning on August the 1st. Uh, police officers were trying to uh, ex oh, present or serve an, an arrest warrant, not a search warrant, an arrest warrant on Corinne Gaines. They went to a rental office, got her, got her keys from the rental office, opened the front door. Corinne Gaines didn't know who it was. They actually opened the front door. There was a chain lock on the door. Then they kicked in the door. Corinne Gaines was sitting beside, behind the door, not knowing who it was with a shotgun. Uh, officers retreated from the house immediately, yelled gun, gun, gun. Uh, they contacted SWAT. The standoff began, lasted six hours. Uh, Corinne Gaines tried to um, memorialize what was taking place by having her social media live stream running throughout the entire event. Three minutes after they deactivated her social media account, she was shot dead by Royce Ruby. She was shot from outside of her apartment through a wall in her back. The bullet ricocheted off of the refrigerator, shot her son in the face, and also they came in with more, they stormed the house and came in and finished Corinne Gaines off and ended up shooting, blowing her son's elbow off with assault rifles, that is M16 rifles. So I'm here to discuss the police reform because that's very important to me. I've been advocating for these issues for decades, not only in the courtroom, but also in our state legislature, in our state legis, in our state <laughs> general assembly, uh, just providing testimony and anecdotes to help push these bills along that, uh, that, that are very important to us as African-Americans. I'm proud to say one of the things that I'm proud of in my state is that we pushed the most sweeping police reforms this session than ever before in, 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 in our state, definitely in, in, definitely in the state of Maryland. We had a law enforcement officer's bill of rights that we were one of the first states to enact that law. And uh, this session, we repealed that entire law. The law enforcement officer's bill of rights affords additional rights to law enforcement officers over and above what's provided in our state and federal constitution. So I'm happy to be here, a part of this discussion. And uh, I thank everyone involved and all the esteemed, esteemed panelists uh, for uh, assisting in these very important discussions of our day. Thank you, sir. And last but not least, Attorney uh, Lee Merritt. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so hum humbled to be a part of this panel. I first want to sort of pay homage to Judge Faith Johnson, who uh, not only sort of showed me the ropes in uh, South Dallas, I'm sorry, in Dallas, working uh, um, with the family of Jordan Edwards, a 15-year-old killed in Balt Springs, and watching her pour her heart and soul into that family um, and make sure that the region of North Texas and Dallas knew that justice was bipartisan, that justice didn't split down party lines, uh, but that as a, a woman of faith, 
as a as a woman of um, who has been trained in the law, that she would go about getting justice for the, for the family of Jordan Edwards, um, and then also the family of Botham Shimja. And what people don't know is uh, uh, that our office pursued justice for people like Lyndon Johnson and uh, uh, Lyndo Jones. I'm sorry, and most of you all wouldn't have heard of Lyndo Jones because he had a criminal record and he was shot for being suspected of stealing his own car. Um, and because he was he was in his car uh, having an episode and it, it took a lot of bravery for Judge Johnson to say, well, he deserves justice too. He deserves his day in court and gave him not one, but two days in court after a hung jury um, and, and just really meant was tra did transformative work in that community and prepared me to meet someone like Joyette Holmes, who was doing similar work in, um, in, out of Cobb County and on the behalf of the family of Ahmaud Arbery. And again, it was just, it has been a blessing in my career to advocate for families and to find prosecutors on uh, um, of the caliber of Judge Faith Johnson of Joy Holmes uh, and to learn uh, from people like uh, Jay Wendell Gordon, who has, has done precedent setting work uh, to be inspired by my brother B. Ivory Lamar in his work in Wisconsin, and so many me members of this panel, uh, I feel like I've been, uh, you know, I've been in a crash course of not only civil rights work, but how to advocate for family, how to take your personal passion uh, and place it into into your work uh, to ensure just outcomes for communities and to change the, the the policing culture in America. I'm uh, the legal director for the Grassroots Law Project. I'm. Um, I was born and raised in South Central Los Angeles, raised in a gang culture. And I believe that we uh, have a responsibility to take each of our unique experiences and address the deadliest police culture in the modern world, the most incarcerated, uh, most incarcerated nation in world history. Uh, and, and so on us to do something about it. So I'm looking forward to, to uh, this conversation and the work that we can do together. Thank you all. Um, and in my haste to, to turn it over to the panel, I didn't explain why I have any even a semblance of uh, relevance to this group. And, and I'm certainly humbled to be a part of it, but I started my career um, in the criminal section of the Civil Rights Division, the United States Department of Justice, where I investigated and prosecuted police brutality cases all across the country, uh, which is a, very much a pride of my experience as an attorney and um, something that I will carry with me everywhere. And so jumping back into the panel, I, before we do that, I'll just say for housekeeping, reasons and to move this thing on tonight. If people have questions in the audience, please put them in the chat. I think it will be easier to do that. And I will ask those questions as they come about, but, but let's just jump in and I'll open up this question to anybody on the panel. Um, after we have seen this recent onslaught of unfortunate events, um, first of all, it's not, as I would say, this is not new. This has been happening all along, but with the advent of body cameras and cell phones, we are just seeing it more. When I was at the Department of Justice, every day my desk was filled with, with files of unarmed Black people being shot or being assaulted by police officers. And it was only when cell phone cameras and body cameras were introduced that everyday people were seeing the things that I would see every single day. And so I'm not shocked that this is happening. I don't believe that this is a new thing. It's been going on for, for a long time. But where are we? This is the question for the evening. Where are we? Are we improving things? Are we moving in a positive direction? Or do you feel like we're on a, sort of a treadmill, just running in place? I, I would love to hear your thoughts. Anybody feel free to jump in. I'm cautiously optimistic about where we are as a, a profession, um, as, as a civilization, really, in dealing with policing. Um, there, there was a young man who, was, who died in custody near my home about two and a half of miles away from where I live. I live in Collin County, Texas. Um, most people don't actually know that I'm a resident of North Texas, very conservative area. Um, and I, I've come to anticipate that if someone dies in custody and they're that they, this young man was uh, arrested after um, uh, Allen police officer found a small joint next to him. Uh, less than two ounces of marijuana and he was suffering a schizophrenic episode that the officer actually did a good job of perceiving saying that this person was having exhibiting some strange behavior uh, two years ago three years ago this was the kind of case uh, that would not well, it, one would question with if it would ever be presented to a grand jury let alone receive national attention but you know to my 
pleasant surprise, although I hate that we're going through each of these cases. This was something that CNN and TMZ was interested in. This was something that the Collin County prosecutor has met with me and the family of Mar Marvin Scott III on a weekly basis, um, has shared the video evidence, has brought us into his confidence um, in that office of, uh, of Greg Willis in, in Collin County, which again, if you knew some of these characters like Sister Faith Johnson knows, it, this is not normal, right? And so I've been, um, I've been pleasantly surprised about the progress that we've been able to make in the past couple of years, but it can't just be in form alone. It can't just be in grand jury presentations alone, but we need to see greater um, accountability, appropriate sentencing, and more importantly, a shift in the policing culture that mm -hmm. prevents this from happening so often. I, I um, you know, I, I've, working in the civil rights realm is like drinking water out of the fire hydrant. Um, there is no shortage of cases and they're coming at you all at once. And you realize that, you know, no matter how hard you work, uh, there is a river of injustice and family and suffering right behind the case that you're currently working. So as we learned that, uh, you know, because of some of the work that Joy at uh, Holmes and her office did in South Georgia, that there will be federal hate crime indictments for the men who murdered Ahmaud Arbery. We also learned, you know, I spent the day that, that day yesterday morning watching five hours of in custody video of uh, Marvin Scott being uh, restrained to death um, and, for, and, and, and speaking with the medical examiner about why it wasn't excited delirium, uh, why it wasn't nat a natural cause death, why it was homicide, what the, the causes of them, the mechanisms for the homicide were and, and how we, begin, we can begin to sort of debunk the myths of, um, the lack of humanity of people who die in custody and um, the, the, the right uh, for accountability and justice, even for the least of these. I would have to echo what, what Leah said. Uh, what I've found in my practice is that you're getting more participation from uh, other professionals. We get calls from doctors who want to be a part of this movement of police reform. Uh, who want to volunteer their time or offer their expert opinions on, on our cases. So I'm really encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by the fact that uh, the community is very much so aware and they're taking their awareness to the ballot with them. We are removing elected officials uh, who are not pursuing uh, justice the way we believe it should be pursued. We are engaging our own elected officials to encourage and urge and sometimes demand their votes on certain legislation. We are more politically astute. We are more civic minded than I've ever seen us in the past. And all of these things are the necessary ingredients for change. I'm very encouraged by the work of Lee Merritt that I see in his high profile work. I'm encouraged by the work of Ben Crump and, and uh, Chris Stewart. The list goes on, Justin Bamberg. I mean, I can name them all over the country. Uh, Dante Point, Point, I mean, I can name them all over the country. Uh, the work that we all are doing and, that's that, and I'm very inspired to see African-American attorneys at the forefront of these issues, championing these causes for our people because there's so many times when our people see us take losses, but now we are getting victories. I mean, the George Chauvin case, hopefully, uh, if it didn't set a new precedent, hopefully it provided guidance uh, to those who engage in this work as to how uh, these types of cases should be uh, litigated and how justice should be pursued. Gone are the days when us civil rights attorneys can rest on the fact that we were able to secure a multi-million dollar verdict or settlement for our clients. That's mm -hmm. not enough anymore. We yeah. need to have criminal prosecutions. We need to engage our legislators to change some of these laws and do away with some of these antiquated laws that have caused uh, carnage uh, over the over decades, over several decades. So, you know, big up to everyone who's out here in this struggle, in this fight. And I always say, when you see a good fight, you get in it. And I'm so encouraged that everyone, at least on this panel, have found good fights to get into. So kudos to us.
Absolutely. And, it, and, I, and I definitely want to add just a couple remarks and, of course, salute the work of J. Wendell Gordon and, and Lee Merritt. I was able to observe, you know, their work just, you know, coming into this industry as far as civil rights go and, and just being able to see the progression. And I think that we've come a long way. I think the community um, has come a long way in being more energized and making the demands um, for these reforms. Uh, but I think also um, we have a lot more work to do. Obviously, uh, there's been a lot of marching. And again, marching is important. It brings awareness to these issues amongst the countries, I mean, across the country. But I think that we have to be, um, you know, more, I think as legal advisors um, in of such that the community depends on, I think we have to do um, more of a job of educating the community on certain legal principles. So for example, um, if we ask the community about qualified immunity, many of which wouldn't have a clue what we're talking about. So it's very difficult to reform and ask for limitations for officers being granted um, qualified immunity and trying to reform that if the community can't really join us because they're not really aware. So there's, I think there's a lot of things that we can do as legal advisors um, to our community, educate them on these different challenges that we have. Um, and then again, what comes to mind is the body cams. A lot of the things that we see, especially in the George Floyd and other cases, um, the Jacob Blake, is that there was independent video. You know, this wasn't necessarily um, released by body cam. And while a lot of jurisdictions now have body cam within their local police departments, um, now there's a fight on getting them released. And that is one of the experiences that, you know, myself and, and Ben Crump is fighting in Wisconsin with the Joel Acevedo case is now we have to sue the police department uh, to get them to release the video. And then now there's questions on whether that video would result in a fair or impartial jury uh, by doing so. So again, we have a lot of work to do. Um, number one, I think is to get body cams uh, uniformly uh, granted across the country. And then number two, um, making sure that they're released immediately uh, when these incidents occur. And Christopher, I just wanted to jump in just for uh, one little thought. I think it's very important that we have the, the right person at the head. I mean, because look at what happened in Dallas County when I was a DA. As uh, Lee Merritt mentioned, my first case was not the Othan John case. It was a Roy Oliver case. In fact, they were almost back to back. But before we did, before we prosecuted Roy Oliver, there had not been a police officer convicted in Dallas County in 40 years. Think about it, 40 years. And when that police officer in Dallas was convicted 40 years before, he only got five years. And he was convicted when he was playing Russian roulette with a young kid in the back of the sword car, trying to get a confession out of him, putting a gun to his head and blew his head off based on trying to get a confession. confession. And he only had five years. So that was 40 years before we did the Roy Oliver case. And it's only reason why we have the raw Oliver case is because you have a DA and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I was committed to justice. And that's part of the key. Right people heading up your, doubt, your DA's offices across the land. Look at what happened even before the raw Oliver case in Dallas County. So many DA's offices had, didn't even bring cases, were afraid to bring cases because they didn't know the, black, the backlash they would have gotten. So they weren't willing, they didn't have the courage to do it. Just based on one simple thing, justice, fairness, what's right. And that's what we need more importantly than anything else, is to have people who's willing to do the right thing and to sacrifice it, whatever the cost is. <laughs> whatever the cost is to do what's right. You gotta be willing to do what's right. So that's what's so critical to you. You do, I agree um, with you, Judge. Doing what's right, even in the face of um, detriment to self is important yes. in these cases. Yes. And continuing to speak up. And you know, I can definitely speak for Ms. Wanda Cooper-Jones, Ahmad's mother and all that she did 
um, to change and eliminate laws in the state of Georgia. You know, it is about doing more than just operating in our silos, which can be the courtroom or, you know, in our offices. It's getting those legislators' attention and educating the public. The citizen's arrest law that the McMichaels and Roddy Bryan thought that they could use with impunity and just do what they wanted to do is no longer in the state of Georgia. The hate, um, hate crimes law has now been enacted in Georgia as a part of Georgia law and enhanced sentencing. So I agree, cautiously optimistic on what can go forward as long as yeah. we keep speaking out and keep educating uh, yes. those other people in the public so that when we are not available to have a conversation in a place that we're not close to, that there are surrogates that continue to stand yes. in the gap to do exactly that. Yes, exactly. I also want to say that um, we have to continue to march. And I know Biari Lamar is like, you know, we need to do marching and something else. I agree with him 100%. But I don't want to dismiss marching. As council, I really don't march, but I encourage, I aid, and abet marchers. It's also important to, for us as council to engage our activist community. They can do the ground and pound work that we can't do. That is very effective work for someone to agitate, agitate, agitate in an organized fashion is very, uh, very uh, pow is a very powerful uh, weapon in our arsenal. So we must always, and I have have all times have to explain this to people who I've hired, my PR people, as a matter of fact, who I've hired to work for me. Uh, it's very important that anybody who wants to help and has the ability to help should be able to help. I don't care who gets it first. I don't care who gets to shine because police violence, police abuse, police misconduct is not an issue that's exclusive to either me, my clients, or anyone else. These issues are, these issues are universal issues. These are very important community issues. These are very important state and national issues. So no one owns the issue. We all have something to do and we all should do what we're good at. And if law is your thing, be the lawyer. If you're the lawyer, you don't have to be the marcher, but aid and abet them. If they need, if they need a couple of dollars to, to, to create some flyers or some signs, give them a thousand, whatever, you know, because everybody is important and no one, no one is, 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 um, well, unimportant for lack of a better word. Yeah, I just, Thank uh, you again, all. I want to sort of send my amen corner to Brother Gordon and, and uh, Judge Faith Johnson knows and probably Joy Holmes a little bit. I'll go out there and march with him too. But, but I uh, I really do appreciate uh, the strength that comes from, I, I was talking about my story in Little Collin County, Texas, uh, but the reason why I have really conservative prosecutors who, who don't have the heart, and I again, I, I can't say enough about uh, uh, people like Joy at Holmes and Faith Johnson. Joy, uh, I spoke to Wanda Cooper, Ahmad's mom, the other day, and Joy is, is, is removed from the case. She's going on with her career. But she texts Wanda to say, hey, I was just checking to see, see on you how, you how you're doing, because they, they had a real human connection. And, um, you know, Sister Allison Zhe, the mother of both Mujong, loves Faith Johnson more than she loves me, to my, to my disappointment. <laughs> and, um, you know, they made, they made real human connections. But when, when, when the carrot doesn't work, you also need a stick. And so in McKinney, where they're not, you know, Greg Willis is not making a human connection with the family of Marvin Scott from St. Louis, Missouri. He's just not. Uh, but outside of his office are members of his community uh, who are writing Marvin Scott's name on the courthouse steps in chalk, uh, who are protesting in front of the jail. They've been protesting for 45 days now. McKinney is the third largest city, uh, third fastest growing city in the country. And they want, they want their black residents and corporations to know that they're, they're a community that's safe, that they're not going to be, you know, the McKinney from the McKinney pool party, if you all recall, but there's some sort of new McKinney that has, you know, protections for all of its citizens. But if they have citizens showing up in the streets and protesting at the Allen Premium outlet malls and, um, and boycotting and hashtagging and on CNN and on you know, damaging, potentially damaging the reputation of the city where they may not be able to make the human connection. The Judge uh, Johnson and, uh, and 
sister homes made with their family, they make the economic connection that this is not going to be good for them or their careers to disregard this family. Um, and so, yeah, um, the, the work of a activists, advocates, marchers, protesters, it was like a boost of strength when we had a protest in all 50 cities. Uh, no, you know, normally I couldn't go and throw my weight around in a, a prosecutor's office in, in, um, in St. Louis, Missouri. You know, they wouldn't be interested but because um, the prosecutors and the city officials had to consider the reputation of the city and the willingness of the people to stand up. They suddenly want to meet with families and see what they could do to uh, move them towards justice. And it, it just meant, has meant a great deal the past, this past year. So we are sadly short on time and there's never enough time to discuss these issues. But my understanding is that Commissioner Oliver Gilbert, uh, who is going to be on a panel later, um, has to leave. And so I wanted to invite him to join our group and, and provide any remarks that he might have on these issues. Come on. Th thank you, Chris. Um, let me just say, first of all, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an, uh, a fan in, of all the work that, that everyone has spoken has done. Uh, it, it's amazing that what we can accomplish when we purpose ourselves, um, when we purpose ourselves in the direction of justice. You know, I, I'm Oliver Gilbert. I'm the vice chairman of the county commission here in Miami-Dade County. Before this, I was the mayor of Miami, Miami Gardens. Miami Gardens is the largest black city in the state of Florida. And I inherited a police department. And, and I agree with everything that everyone has said. I would just add this, that there, there, is, that there is a mechanism for local legislators, local elected officials to actually effectuate change in their police departments. One of the things that I did when I inherited the police departments, I understood there were problems. And so I instantly said, we're gonna change how we actually hire police officers. We're gonna hire police officers from our community. We're gonna take kids who wanna be policemen in Miami Gardens, the largest black city in the state of Florida. And we're gonna send them to the police academy. They're gonna be police officers in their own community. And, and people said, well, you, you're not gonna be able to do that, but then we did it. And now we're on our sixth class. And, and then I said, we're gonna give every police officer community policing training. We're gonna give every police officer implicit bias training. We're gonna make every police officer uh, wear a body cam. And, and then the most important component of all of that, once we trained you and you, we signed off on all these trainings, um, if you do something, we're going to fire you. And, and people would say there was diff it's difficult to fire a police officers, and it is, but in the eight years that I was mayor, we fired 12 of them. Because, because we are going to be the ultimate determiners of what we find to be acceptable. And, and this idea that, well, no one was shot. Yeah, yeah it, there's a lot of things that happen before people get shot. So you challenge that behavior all along the way and you understand that you're gonna create a culture that this isn't going to be acceptable. And, and I think there's a place for that. And, and to, the, to the extent that, that we, could, we could put an amplifier on that and put a spotlight on that and, and understand that there's, there's room for local uh, policymakers to actually create police departments that, that respect life and that want to understand that their job is to protect and serve everybody. And that, that the people out there on the streets, they just want to go home just like them. It, we can do that. And that's what we work towards in Miami Gardens. And it's by no means uh, perfect. But, but it's something that I know can be done because we were, in fact, doing it. So I appreciate being a part of this conversation. And, and thank you all for doing the work that you do around the country. Um, you, you're the new civil rights, leader, civil, civil rights leaders. And so what you're doing right now is actually changing the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mayor Gilbert. Um, and so we only have a few more minutes, but I just want to open the floor uh, to the panel for any final thoughts and remarks before we move on to our uh, legislative response. I want to. I want to just. I want to just say. I think that um, this is like, as I mentioned before, this is a historic time. Um, we still have a lot of work to do, and we're really just thankful for just everyone's um, involvement and accomplishments that we've gotten um, this year. Um, but this year in 2021. We, we already have 319 people that have been killed by police um, just this year alone. Um, and if we look at back at the years from 2013 to 2020, 98% uh, of those killings did not result in charges. So I think that just seeing what we um, have accomplished with the George Floyd case, and then also recently um, in the uh, Dante Wright case and seeing how quickly um, those off those that officer was charged, um, I think is um, causes optimism as to where we're going. 
Um, but again, I think there's there's a lot of work to do, and um, I think that long as everyone is continually engaged, um, I think we're we're and also I want to bring attention to the George Floyd Policing Act that um, is pending in the Senate right now. I think that um, I've looked at that, and I think a lot of the demands that the community has called for is represented in that bill. Obviously, it's not perfect. Um, I do think it's a start, but I think it's important for us to be uniform in our calls to action and um, I think that is the beginning um, of our of our change that we are are seeking. I guess I can I can speak now. Um, uh, the case law says that qualified immunity ap applies to everyone except the incompetent and those who knowingly violate the law. Corinne Gaines was shot by Corporal Royce Ruby in Baltimore County. He tried to. Uh, take advantage of the qualified immunity doctrine and he was denied that opportunity by the court and it was rejected by the jury. So the jury found that he was responsible for Corinne Gaines' wrongful death. My issue is this, two actually. One, that he was never criminally prosecuted because he wasn't considered um, competent and he wasn't ill he was either considered incompetent or he was considered someone who knowingly violated the law. When you get a civil verdict, that's enough for probable cause to have someone charged. I would say if you have enough evidence to survive a civil verdict, you have enough evidence to charge someone. When you get a verdict that's $38 million, that's a message. That's not just a simple verdict, that's a message. And it sent a message that was loud and clear that what his conduct was, was absolutely unacceptable, it was wrong. And to me, I believe the message was that it was criminal. Now, what, what menaces me the most is that he's still on the police force. He has not suffered any uh, disciplinary action. His pension is still intact. Uh, he's still getting his promotions, pay raises, and all of, the, all, of the, all, of, all of the accoutrements of being an officer, all the privileges, immunities, and benefits. He still receives them. I find that unconscionable. That's my fight. When these officers, when you get a judgment against them, I mean, so many of these cases settle and nobody has to admit to any liability. But when you actually put your case in front of a jury and receive the judgment for it, I don't think that officer deserves to have a badge or a gun when he's, in my opinion, disgraced it. Thank you. I guess I will use this opportunity to again, <laughs> I've been a, a Brother Wendell Gordon's echo chamber. Uh, but I, I, I will use this opportunity to say, um, you know, there, there are certain steps that we need to take uh, to dismantle the system that exists. And something that uh, Sister Faith Johnson and I have learned uh, is uh, through the case of, of, of Roy Oliver, the civil case in that case is ongoing. And the reason that it's ongoing is because there is a direct incentive for families not to seek criminal accountability for police officers in these cases, uh, because it absolves the city of their responsibility to indemnify. If, if an officer is found guilty, the way Roy Oliver was found guilty of murder and Amber Geiger was found guilty of murder in, in Dallas County, uh, then the city of Dallas and the city of Ball Springs can then sort of wash their hands and say, well, that's all the justice that you get uh, because uh, we're not accustomed to and we in, 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 in the city of Dallas and the city of Ball Springs and so many other cities where there have been these rare, you know, less than 2% of cases that result in, in actual conviction or criminal accountability for officers, even less than 2% um, um, are actually found guilty of homicide charges. But when that does occur, uh, when families push for that, uh, then the law allows and, the, uh, and police unions are silent about their uh, the officers being, hang out, um, being hung out to dry, cities cutting ties with the officers um, and, um, you know, not dealing with um, um, the responsibility to indemnify those officers and, and, and having to tell families that. That's a, that was a difficult conversation that we had to have with the family of both Michelle uh, to say, you know, if you push as hard as you would like for criminal accountability, uh, then the likelihood is uh, the city of Dallas and um, and the community even will abandon um, the the responsibility for civil accountability uh, and and for um, uh, an opportunity for your family to be made whole. Uh, and so, yeah, we we need to find more ways to continue to uh, ensure that there is justice on both sides, both from a policy perspective and from a cr criminal account accountability perspective. 
Uh, Judge Johnson or Attorney Holmes, do you have anything further before we close? Wanted to give you an opportunity if you did. Yes, I just want to quickly say, even as we look at what do we do in terms of uh, police reform, obviously we need to try to figure out what does that look like and how do we define it. And, and one of the things I think is so important when we continue in down this road, because I, I do believe that things are progressing, uh, we still need to look at training of officers and we still need to look at selection because some of the people who we, who we select to be police officers never should have been selected. A lot of folks who are coming on these police forces, they coming on for the purpose to be able to play out whatever fantasy, whatever dream, whatever vision they have. So it's so important, it's so critical that we do training and we do correct selection of the people throughout the nation not in one little part, throughout the nation, in some of these small towns. We need to look at how do we correct some of the selection of who, we, who we're hiring to be police officers. Because some of the people have no idea, they probably never even met a black person before. Don't even know how to deal with blacks, how to deal with Hispanics, how to deal with minority. So we need to think about that. And those are the kinds of things we need to get back with our legislators about, is that how do we put this in place, in writing, in terms of who we hire and who we don't hire? Because that is significant in terms of addressing this whole issue of police brutality and also police, uh, police reform. So I think that's critical. Right, and we really need to make sure that we stay connected with those organizations who right now don't really think that these issues touch them, whether it's our local chambers, organizations, um, our fraternities, sororities, churches, different faith communities, and make sure they're at the table. So I know a lot of these uh, police departments and municipalities are starting uh, citizen review panels specifically around law enforcement and what changes need to be made so we don't continue to see these things and seeing where other people aren't engaged because they think it does not matter for them or for their community and engage them because it's truly going to take all of us to make sure that we've got proper training in our law enforcement agencies that our city councils and commission um, boards know what the issues are and where the corrections need to go and how to get funding for the things on the other side of law enforcement and those um, citizen review and other groups that will go to the scene of a, a mentally ill person who is having an episode, someone having a seizure who might not be able to be um, controlled and should not be controlled by law enforcement as opposed to somebody who can truly treat that issue. So just really engaging our whole communities and um, not being uh, in separate corners of the room, not letting the things that are different about us cause us to not be able to put into place those laws that should be either put into place or taken away as has been exemplified here in Georgia. Um, so I'm excited about those who are in the fight right now, the fight that's going to continue and the work that's being done. And I thank you all that are on this panel, National Bar Association, for having this so that we can continue the dialogue, dialogue that I know will be action. Uh, panelists, thank you so much for your powerful remarks and the powerful influence that you continue to display in our communities. And thank you for the work that you've done in the past and that you will continue to do. Um, it, it is now my pleasure to turn this over to Dean Tony Verona from the University of Miami School of Law, a great law school, and we look forward to hearing from other academics and people in legislative roles on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Chris. Um, I'm very honored to join you uh, this evening for this very uh, important and topical conversation. I thank all of the members and planners from the National Bar Association and all of our sponsors and, and hosts for making this evening possible. Uh, I thank all of my co-panelists for their words and their wisdom. It is a great honor and privilege for me to share this virtual podium with all of you. I was asked to say a few words about the ABA's Legal Education Police Practices Consortium and the Association of American Law School's Anti-Racist Clearinghouse Project. These are two, just two 
very prominent examples of the legal education responses to the crisis that we have in law enforcement and specifically the crisis of racist policing. There are many other initiatives across the country at the, Uni at the University of Miami School of Law. We have various co curricular initiatives underway. We have hosted faculty anti-racist pedagogy sessions. We have undertaken other initiatives to study and address these issues. As I tell my students, every law student, every law professor, every law school dean, and every lawyer must understand that racism in our system of law and law enforcement is an existential threat to that system, to our system. The rule of law and our democracy itself require that every one of our citizens is treated with fairness and respect by all instrumentalities of law. So it is up to us, the ministers of law and the members of the legal profession to eradicate racism in all of its forms. So let me give you a bit of a sketch of these two programs. First, the ABA Consortium. In response to the early 2020 police killings of unarmed black people in the United States, a number of deans of US law schools, and I'm honored to have been one of these deans, came together to see what we could do as legal educators to inform and devise and catalyze efforts for reforming police practices in the nation so that the incidents of racist and abusive policing that we keep seeing in the headlines would cease. A total of 54 law schools came together, and that number is growing, to join the American Bar Association Legal Education Police Practices Consortium. Loyola New Orleans Law School Dean and former judge Madeline Landrieu chairs our 10-member Dean's Advisory Council, upon which I'm uh, honored to serve. We are still at the start of our planning efforts, even though we've been working very hard over the last 10 months as a consortium, and in fact are in the process of hiring an executive director for the ABA Consortium on Police Practices Reform. If you know, if anybody participating uh, on this uh, Zoom knows of anyone who would be uh, a good candidate for that role, please do send them my way and I will put them in touch with Dean Landrew and my colleagues on the Dean's uh, Council. Uh, so what is the consortium? Uh, what, what have we started uh, in uh, terms of programs over the last year and what do we aim to uh, do? I will direct you to the consortium website at the ABA for more information, uh, but here are some of the high points, and I'm going to be reading the first two paragraphs from our mission statement on our website. So, quote, the ABA Legal Education Police Practices Consortium aims to contribute to the national effort examining and addressing legal issues in policing and public safety including conduct, oversight, and the evolving nature of police work. The consortium will leverage the ABA's expertise and that of participating ABA accredited law schools to collaborate on projects to develop and implement better police practices throughout the United States. Second paragraph, the consortium will provide the means to, among other things, advance improved police practices at local, state, and national levels, to achieve that goal, the ABA and the participating law schools will leverage the ABA's leadership on model police practices and law school's capacity to work with key community stakeholders to promote these model policies. Drawing on the geographic diversity of the ABA, since we have about 200 law schools across the US, the participating law schools and their networks, the consortium will advance the widespread adoption of model police practices and initiate other projects designed to support effective policing, promote racial equity in the criminal justice system, and eliminate tactics that are racially motivated or have a disparate impact based on race." Unquote. So this is a very ambitious mission. And, uh, and it is a very important mission. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about what we have been doing that's been practical. 
We've been hosting webinars. Uh, for example, um, a couple of months ago, we hosted one on the future of policing, policing for tomorrow with various uh, leaders in the reform effort and academic uh, leaders. Also, transforming police practices, ethical policing, and active bystandership on January 22nd. We are in the process of organizing more webinars, and we will be in touch with all of you soon to let you know what we are doing along those lines. We are tracking and, in fact, plan to propose model legislation with partners. We hope to participate in the drafting of that model legislation. On our website, we have been building a clearinghouse of research guides for legal scholars and students on police reform uh, topics and anti-racist policing topics. We also have a hyperlinked database on audiovisual resources, discussion guides, and lesson plans for police practices and reform topics, not just for law schools, but principally for legal educators and, and law students. But these resources can be used by any, any educator uh, at any level. And we have a national calendar of events and other resources. Again, our efforts are less than a year old, and we hope to build out the consortium over the next year or two so that it becomes a major resource and driver for anti-racist police reform efforts across the nation from the academic uh, field. We hope that many of you will join our efforts in the months and years to come. I also wanted to share with you a few words about the Association of American Law Schools Law Dean's Anti-Racist Clearinghouse Project. This was the brainchild of five of my sister law deans, Dean Angela Awachi Willig from Boston University, Dean Kim Mutcherson from Rutgers, Dean Carla Pratt from Washburn, Dean Danielle Holly Walker from Howard, and Dean Danielle Conway from Penn State. Those five decanal colleagues have done a superb job of leading us, leading those of us who, who joined them in building a, a, a brilliant clearinghouse website with links to books, articles, studies, websites, music, art, solidarity statements, all around anti-racist pedagogy. Um, also, action plans and many other resources are on that site. I will plug the URL to that site and to the ABA um, Anti-Racist Police Practices uh, website into our chat room. Um, again, it is an honor to be here, uh, and it is an honor to join you. Thank you all for your wisdom, and I wish you all very well. Uh, it is now my honor to turn the virtual podium. Uh, over to my dear and distinguished Miami Law colleague, a nationally renowned scholar in constitutional and criminal law and procedure, Professor Donald Jones. Professor Jones. Uh, thank you for uh, that wonderful introduction. And for those who don't know, I pay people for introductions. So wonderful is that. Uh, let me be, and, and you know, I think that I can't, I want to share this with everyone. I, I can't tell you how happy we were to get Dean Verona. He is not merely a great scholar. He's a great activist, you know, and we have an expression in the black community. You, you have to walk it like you talk it. He does both. Um, thank you, Dean Verona, for, for joining us. Um, let me begin with, uh, you know, what is most close to me. And that's a, a word from Dr. King. He says, uh, and his I have a dream speech, he says, we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. And in some ways, his words are prophetic. He not merely described the police dogs and the, and the nightsticks of, 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 of police, uh, he was describing uh, what we have seen just recently through a kind of prophecy, the horrors of Ahmed Arbery being murdered by vigilantes. He's describing through prophecy the brutal murder of uh, George Floyd as a policeman knelt on his neck for not over nine minutes. And I think what he's describing is a trans-historical experience that Blacks have had in which we see the law only as enemy. Why is it that we always see it that way? At least in part, the answer has to be, it's because we have not 
made it stop. It's going to be up to us as Black people and our allies to make it stop. And uh, we have a crisis when we see, see the kind of tragedy we see with, with Arbery, with Breonna Taylor. But for every crisis, every crisis hides an opportunity. And our opportunity, the Chinese word for, our, for crisis is an opportunity the same. Our opportunity is for us to gird ourselves together and develop strategies, effective strategies which will end this forever. I think that I have a student who tells me we're going to end police brutality in our lifetime. Let's make that true. And I think one of the, there are many people who play, who play a role, as, as I think my friend Merritt has said, but I think that legislators play a special role because you shape the laws, you shape the policies which govern our country and our states. And so we have a panel and this panel, we will address the question of what can legislators do and what can legislators in conjunction with warriors and academics do to make the killings stop, uh, to make the horror stop. Uh, so I'm gonna begin by going around the, the panel and uh, asking each panelist to announce themselves. I would ask you to, uh, in respect for our serious time limitations, to limit for about a minute or two. But I want everyone to introduce themselves and announce themselves. And let us start with uh, Charnel Herring. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Charnel Herring. I'm the majority leader in the Virginia House of Cal uh, Delegates. Um, I will just briefly just say that people of color, especially black people know the concerns and fears when it comes to interaction with the police. We have the talk with our children when they're driving age. And in fact, in 2017 in Virginia, we actually passed legislation to make sure that that's part of the school's curriculum. But during the COVID pandemic, when we're all quarantined in our homes, we watched the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many more. And it laid bare the injustices that we have in our criminal justice system, from police interaction on the street to arrest, trial, incarceration, probation, and even in Virginia, uh, we just passed laws to allow expungement. Um, this past, during the last year, we actually had a special session where we tackled legislation, where we tried and tried, but we finally got things passed like de decertification of officers and sharing police off, uh, records, employee records of police um, between departments so that cops don't get hired in other police departments. We banned the no-knock warrant. We instituted a Marcus Alert program so that people are dealing with mental health crisis. The response is not police with a, with a taser or a gun, which could escalate um, the situation. We created the Civilian Re uh, Oversight Review Boards in Virginia. And I just say in summary, my opening is that the role, of, as I believe that police and sheriffs have, is to protect individuals' constitutional rights and uh, not to be a threat to them. So we still have a lot of work to do. We certainly had a lot of accomplishments, but the work is not over. We've got a whole bunch of work to do. So thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, uh, Representative Herring. Uh, next will be, I think it is, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Senator Ramesh Akbari uh, from Tennessee. Uh, please announce yourself. Uh, thank you, and certainly, I am pleased to be on this panel with you all. My name is Ramesh Akbiri. I'm a state senator from Memphis, Tennessee. I serve as the Senate Democratic Caucus chairwoman. Uh, we are not in the majority. We are actually in the super minority. Uh, but uh, police reform is something that our legislature has tackled uh, this year. I also serve on the Reimagining Policing Task Force for the city of Memphis. So uh, I, I view that uh, most of the changes that have to occur have to have to be from a change in the law. Uh, if, if, if we're going to get serious about actually having meaningful police reform, laws have to change and funding priorities have to go along with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and, uh, one, and from the great state of Texas, uh, representative is Representative uh, Ron Reynolds. Hello, hello. I just stepped back off the House floor, actually. I'm so excited to be with such distinguished panelists. Uh, this is such a timely conversation. I want to thank President-elect Moore uh, and members of the National Bar Association for having this relevant conversation at such a time as this. We're at a critical moment in our country, and we really are 
on the verge of a real transformation in terms of the likes we haven't seen since the death of Emmett Till. Yes. With the death of George Floyd. We are really on the cusp of the modern day, instead of the civil rights movement, policing and criminal justice reform movement. And we have to continue to lead the efforts. Uh, what we saw with the with the verdict, the guilty verdict uh, of, of, of officer, former officer Chauvin was just a beginning, but we need meaningful criminal justice reform, policing legislation to pass. At the federal level, uh, we, we just passed some bills today on the House floor uh, that I'm very proud of that were standalone bills, but we need this to be enacted at the federal level. So I'm really encouraging us to continue to use our voice to push the U.S. Senate to pass the George Floyd Policing Act. It is time. We cannot continue to kick the can down the road and continue to see unarmed Black men killed and Black men and women killed by the hands of police. There needs to be accountability. There needs to be, uh, you know, the end of banning chokeholds and, and we need to get rid of qualified immunity. We need to have an officer's duty to intervene. We need no knock warrants uh, to get rid of that. So there are so many things that we can do. And I'm so proud that we're leading that conversation here with this group and the NBA. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Representative Reynolds. Uh, last but not least, by any stretch of the imagination, Councilman Steve Hockaday, please announce yourself. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Professor Jones, uh, for your capable uh, moderation of this panel. Uh, it's, it's really a privilege to be on this, on this call with senators and representatives. Um, this is such an illustrious panel, uh, but we're here uh, to discuss one of the most critical issues that plagues the Black community in the past 402 years, I'd say. Um, I'm humbled to be able to offer contributions for tonight's discussion from my space as a local legislator uh, and as a Black man, first and foremost, uh, who remains on a constant journey to discover how I can use uh, the power and privilege that I have to change the legislative direct direction of, uh, of our local communities uh, and also to help to influence on the state level. Uh, as well from my perch uh, as council president in Plainfield, New Jersey. So you, you, you may ask, you know, how does a local legislator fit in this, this distinguished uh, group, you know, uh, in, from New Jersey when, you know, we, we have some issues in New Jersey as well, but a lot of these extrajudicial murders have been occurring in Minnesota and Kentucky and Texas, just, just to name a few. Uh, but the reality is New Jersey has some of the worst black white disparities in the country. Uh, so we have or organizations like the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice under the capable le leadership of Ryan Haygood, uh, who are doing groundbreaking work uh, researching and, uh, and, and the pol public policy uh, partnership with them uh, is making a difference in, in the way that we are approaching uh, the issue here in New Jersey. Uh, and we hope that it manifests, that it, that it spreads uh, to other states so that they can you know, take heed of some of the things that are going on here and how we're able to you know, not quite prevent uh, what's going on in some of the other places. I mean, we, we, it, that may be a tall ask and, and we're not immune in New Jersey, but uh, it's, it's uh, extremely important to share best practices uh, and because this, this issue is a national issue and we need to, to make sure this is rolled out uh, throughout the country. You know, so uh, if, from the ravaging of the coronavirus pandemic uh, to persistent violence of police against black people, disparities in wealth, health and criminal justice, what we're seeing is the deeply embedded cracks of structural racism in our foundation erupt into earthquakes in, back, in black communities. So we need to make sure that we're getting ahead of, the, the, uh, of, of this. And, and uh, with, in with the uh, new Moore administration uh, of the National Bar Association, we wanna do our best to take a proactive approach towards this. We're continuing to talk about these issues, see what we can do to pass laws uh, that help our people uh, before things happen. Um, because 
Uh, I would like as a people for us to, to begin to not be so reactionary uh, and, and have to deal with, uh, to only react from the trauma of experiencing uh, or seeing someone get choked out uh, on, on this, on, or, or pressed out, neck pressed, you know, that's trauma. That, is, that, that has certainly prompted a lot of action, but we need to move beyond that uh, and, 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 and take action even when there is no trauma, realize and, and be able to, to, to draw from trauma that others might have experienced to, to, to improve for all. So I'm here today just to hopefully help to provide some solutions uh, and talk about some of the things that we can do to move us all forward. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Councilman Hockaday. And let me begin by saying I'm promote as Professor Donald Jones. I'm honored to be a professor, honored to be a professor at UM. I'm honored to be an author, but I'm not here, you know, as a title. I'm not here as the, I'm here as a Black man with skin in the game. I'm here as an American. I'm here as a human being struggling with the heart-wrenching horror of what I have seen and what we all have witnessed. And I wanna humble myself and seek wisdom and knowledge from this distinguished panel. Uh, let us speak together and find out what we can, can do. And let me begin with, uh, Sharn, uh, with Representative Sharni, and please, if I forget, mess up, mess up your name. Herringow, that's right. <laughs> uh, Ms. Representative Herring, uh, you have stated on your website that we need a legal system that provides equal justice under law. Mm -hmm. And uh, we witnessed just the opposite of that when we saw George Floyd. But then again, when he was convicted, many people uh, in a tri triumphant way said, okay, this is it, we've won. Uh, I want you to give us your assessment of where are we? Have we won? Have we begun taking a step? Uh, there's always a gulf between equal justice and the lived experience of Black Americans. Tell us how far have we come? I, I would honestly say, unfortunately, we've taken a baby step. Um, I think that all that went on during the summer um, after the killing um, caused people to wake up. And I, I, and I say it wasn't for the pandemic where people were in their homes and had to witness it and not look, and they didn't ha have the luxury to look away, to go out to dinner. We, we were forced to see it. Um, our, our white counterparts are forced to, to finally see what we were saying, but it's baby steps. We, we were, and I, I listened to Senator, Senator Akbari saying, we were in the super minority only two years ago and we had tried these bills, but um, it did, but that woke up people that we, and of course there was just the political will, we were in the majority, but with those baby steps, there are things that we can do right now. I also chair the Course of Justice Committee and the Crime Commission, but one of the things I'm doing in the Crime Commission is that any legislation that we study, we must study the, um, the impact that it has on Blacks and people of color. And that's a requirement that I have. Um, and so again, baby steps to answer your question, baby steps, it's a baby step. We've got so much to do because, um, Racism is embedded in our institutions all over, everywhere. And so it's gonna take a lot to strike it down. Okay, okay, thank you so much, Representative Herring. Let us move forward to the great state of Tennessee and Senator Ramesh Akbari. Uh, allow me to ask you, uh, Senator Akbari, as a legislator in the state of Tennessee, you, you sponsored legislation. Uh, addressing economic development in underserved communities, if I'm correct. And you've also worked on criminal justice. I'm wondering if you see a relationship between the need for economic development and the, 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 the vicissitudes and conflicts and dilemmas that we're now facing in criminal justice reform. Are, are, is there a connection? Uh, definitely. De yes, definitely. I mean, I think that's a great question. I would also in their um, education. Um, I, I think that uh, people always like to talk about trickle down economics, but for me, it's the ultimate ripple. If you can give kids a great public education where they are prepared to enter the workforce, which is why I think it's so important that Tennessee pass legislation to um, allow any graduating senior to go to community college or a career or applied technology school free of charge, 
and then went back and anyone over 24 can do the same. Uh, because when you are have a solid education and foundation, uh, one, those are opportunities to, it, to uh, intervene uh, in trauma and, and to tackle adverse childhood experiences, to teach folks how to, to cope and have conflict resolution skills. And then when you're able to build a career for yourself, then there's no need to, to, to delve into the alternative. Uh, so I, I always think that we always look at stuff downstream and say, well, why are so many folks incarcerated? Why are we spending so much money on the cost of incarceration? When if we would just uh, focus our spending on a on really fortifying our schools, like Tennessee is 46 in the nation in education mm. spending. We mm. just passed a budget today, I should say they did, because I actually didn't vote for it, which is kind of tough, but I didn't, uh, that did nothing to change that with a $3 billion surplus in the state. Uh, so I certainly think they're connected. Um, if we can build up our communities where we can shop in our communities, we can work in our communities, uh, then, then, then it totally takes shifts away from, from even, I think, the propensity towards crime. And then I'll also say this, once folks have served their time, there are too many barriers. Like in Tennessee, you have to pay every single fine and fee before mm. you can petition to get your record expunged. And it has its only certain crimes, all nonviolent. Um, even if it was, uh, say, you got into a fight with your college roommate 25 years ago, that's not something that could be expunged in Tennessee. Uh, mm. So that's a barrier there uh, for people to enter the workforce. And then Tennessee is the only state in the entire union where if you owe back child support once you've exited the justice system, you cannot get your right to vote back until mm. after those have been paid. Uh, so I think it's a whole system that kind of works together. And everyone wants to say, well, we'll do this pot of criminal justice reform and this pot and this pot and this pot. And it's not something that's holistic. So you don't actually have real change. And in Tennessee, where it's a, a majority red state, uh, we're finding that you know, we take one step forward on criminal justice reform and then we bump up enhancements. Uh, so we end up spending more money on incarceration and we're not making a meaningful difference in the population. So I do think it's all connected in I know awareness is the first step, but there also has to be political will and those in offices that will actually do the right thing. Thank, thank you, Senator Akbari. And let's move to the great state of Texas and uh, Ron Reynolds. Uh, Ron Reynolds, you have uh, witnessed uh, as a Texas representative the incredible brutality that in recent weeks and months uh, I, I, I'm aware of a, of a black man who was mentally ill, who was shot to death. They called the police for help for a mentally ill relative, and, he, and, and the help they get is that their relative is shot dead. Uh, witness the, and so in Texas, there is this issue as it is nationally, but particularly in Texas. What do we need to focus on? What, what do you think we need to particularly dial in on to begin to address this issue? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that uh, these disparities are real and they aren't just isolated incidences, but there's a pattern and a practice that takes place uh, in communities across this country. And unfortunately, many of my colleagues, uh, just like, uh, you know, um, Tennessee, Texas is a very conservative state. Uh, it, it is very conservative, uh, but these should be about human rights issues. These should be about what is fair and what is just. And we know that our criminal and policing system is not fair nor just. And we have to be willing to hold police officers accountable. And that's something that we rarely see. And I can tell you that whenever we you know, look at these incidences, they try to make them a one-off instead of, hey, you know, we see that this is a, a, a bigger pattern and, and a scheme and how do we make necessary changes? They make excuses for uh, uh, these police officers and that, and, and we, we, we simply say, for example, I had a bill yesterday that would have required uh, a, a civilian review board to have subpoena power so that, so that you aren't just having um, you know, the police investigating the police, but you have citizens in the community that, that you can have transparency, you can have accountability, there's no inherent conflicts of interest, and you can have real investigations into allegations of police misconduct. That is one of the things that we could do uh, to 
uh, bring some meaningful reforms. So we have to impress upon uh, the police and the conservatives that we're not arguing against police. Uh, we're arguing for accountability and in a level playing field. We're not arguing for defund the police to end the police, that false narrative that keeps getting perpetuated. We're advocating for uh, you know, demilitarizing and, and, and making sure that we focus on community policing and things that we can do to train, de-escalation train, uh, implicit bias. That is such a big component that we have. And we have to get real about get rid of racist cops. A racist person that goes to be a police officer, they turn out to be a racist cop. Not all cops are bad. But if you have a racist that's a lawyer, that's a racist lawyer or a racist doctor, but they don't have a gun and a badge. And so we have to get real and have a real conversation about ridding these departments of these rogue bad cops, because those are the seeds that, that root and manifest and make people have a distrust of all the good cops. And so we, we need to be real about it. And, and there needs to be accountability and ownership and then stop having the police unions try to protect these bad cops. That was one of the biggest things that you saw in the Chauvin trial is that officers testified against him. That's rare. That needs to be the norm and not a isolated incident. I, I, I thank you for that, uh, Representative uh, Reynolds. Let me continue this thread with Councilman Steve Hockaday. Uh, you know, very there's a narrative that and he talked about this narrative that this was isolated and that the, the media often tries to portray these as sporadic incidences. Uh, Councilman Hockaday, would you say that the narrative that, there, that the police who commit these acts of brutality are merely bad apples or do we have a rotten tree? Uh, to what extent is it systemic and, and how do you see it as systemic? And if so, if it is systemic, what? how do we remedy the systemic problem? Yeah, uh, excellent question, Professor. Uh, it's certainly a rotten system, a system that's rotten to the core. Um, although it, it, it's, it's you know, for example, in New Jersey, uh, we may not have the, uh, a, a, as many deaths uh, but there still are instances of brutality or unfair treatments or, uh, for example, in certain towns, when you drive th through them, many people expect to be pulled over or, or given tickets uh, and, and, and sort of uh, oppressed economically by disproportionate traffic stops. New Jersey has been uh, a state where, you know, the state police had to be sued for its, its uh for, for driving while black, you know, for the for the uh, the amount of stops, pretextual stops that were occurring on our New Jersey Turnpike. Uh, this is something that's been passed down for so many years, uh, and it's going to take a proactive uh, approach and also legislation in order for us to get through it. So, you know, they, uh, there's a couple things we can do in order uh, to try to grapple with this issue. So first, we need to establish a culture of accountable policing. You know, so what that means is just creating laws locally and at the state level that ensure law enforcement is guided by policies and systems designed to build a culture of accountability that are created and implemented through engagement with community members. So, you know, part of that is also with, with the civilian uh, re review boards. Uh, we need to make sure that, that there is a synergy, some accountability with the community uh, and, and also just so it, 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 we, we know that there uh, is a blue wall of, of, of silence that exists, which perpetuates this culture. Uh, and it, 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 it is something that overall this, this blue wall of silence has not worked out uh, to, to, to be overall positive for black people. You know, so so there needs to be something there, and that and that comes with more accountable policing. Um, yeah, I th I think there also needs to be more education in terms of in, in the community uh, regarding their first and first uh, and Fourth Amendment rights of civilians during police interactions. Um, 
Also, we need to not militarize our local police, right? Because, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, different towns that have military grade equipment uh, that are available to them. And sometimes they even get it from the federal government. Um, so when we create this, this, this military um, state and these, the, in, in the, these military local uh, have these the, these weapons then it, it changes the mindset almost when you when you because because of the capability of this this artillery it, it changes you know what how you engage with your citizens uh, there's also things that you know in New Jersey we we have at least going through the legislature now which uh you know I'm, I'm sure other states are doing I don't have a statistics on other states but we need to uh, banned and criminalize uh, police's police use of chokeholds, right? So you know, so we, we need to do that. That's already in motion in our legislature. Uh, we need to end qualified immunity, right? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's it's like we are we at this point we have essentially codified uh, the officers to 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 get away. With 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 this treatment through through qualified immunity, this is something that 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 we need to 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 address, uh, and the, and then finally, in terms of you know getting the community more engaged, we need to have uh, we need to create opportunities for non police to put to uh, to intervene in certain issues. Maybe it's a domestic issue or something involving youth. You don't need to send police with guns to every interaction you know but the things that i just mentioned are all things that are embedded in our system that we've done for years right so that that so that is the, the is 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 somewhat what's creating uh the, the rottenness to the core because these are things that are all codified so as legislature legislators it's a, it's in, incumbent on us to begin to change the policies that enable all of these things to begin to 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 turn the tide here. So thank you for the question. Let me ask this question since we only have a few minutes. But one of my pet peeves is this: if you go back to 1970s and in early 80s in cities like Baltimore, Washington, there were only hundreds of arrests a year. If you go to major cities now, there are sometimes over 100,000, over 130,000 arrests a year. And each of those arrests is an opportunity for a confrontation, sometimes a deadly one. I'm wondering about, as legislatures, have you considered the possibility of decriminalization? Uh, for example, uh, how many people are arrested for marijuana? Terrence Crutcher, I remember, was arrested for marijuana. He never survived the arrest. How many people are arrested or stop for broken taillight? Uh, is it really necessary to allow stops for broken taillights? Uh, how many people are arrested for, in, in, in Miami, uh, at least Fort Lauderdale, the, a woman was arrested for driving a bicycle, riding a bicycle without a registration for the bicycle. I'm not making this up. And uh, the people are arrested for driving with windows that are tinted to dark. And each of those arrests is an opportunity for confrontation and an opportunity. One way I'm thinking that we could look at this, and I, I want your thoughts, it takes, look at some of the laws that are out there, take some of them off the books, take away the power of the police. I know the last time I said is, is in, in Florida, they said that you do not have to arrest for marijuana. They took away the notion that you had to arrest for marijuana. It became discretionary. At that point, the marijuana arrest went up for Black people. So I, I'm throwing it out. Is Could decriminalization of certain things like marijuana, uh, like riding a car with a dark windshield, could we address some of these through decriminalization? So Professor, if I, could, if I could start on that, because we did, we did decriminalize marijuana in Virginia and, um, and last year, and we actually saw the, that the arrest did not decline. So this year we actually legalized simple possession starting July of this year, um, as well as we did eliminate allowing pretextual stops. So things that you mentioned like the tenant windows, broken taillight, it had to be both taillights out because that's a public safety uh, uh, issue. 
Um, but all of those sort of pretexts, we, we trying to minimize, right? The interaction between police and, and the public. We will see, we are gonna certainly measure to see if that does have an impact in decreasing the arrests. Um, but you, you make an excellent good, uh, point and that is what we're, we're trying to do in Virginia and we, so, but we'll see, we're gonna contact, as I say, continually measure and see what's happening with the impact of the legislation. Excellent, excellent. A a anyone else on that point? Well, I certainly think uh, it's a great idea, and that's why it's so important that local and state uh, governments are all trying to tackle this, because in Tennessee, our local governments decided to do some decriminalization measures. And then, of course, our state came back and said um, it can only happen on state level. However, our DA has at least said it, not ours, because mine charges at will, but the one in Nashville will not. Uh, but I certainly think there are opportunities uh, to, to make a difference, to decrease the amount of interaction uh, wholeheartedly. Okay, Councilman Hockaday, uh, Representative Reynolds, any thoughts? Yeah, I'll just say a, a, a word or two. In New Jersey uh, just, uh, you know, they took a referendum and people overwhelmingly wanted to, uh, to legalize marijuana and I think it was a good decision. Uh, but <clears throat> what a tough fight. Uh, we had in our legislature in terms of how that actually looks. Uh, we, uh, they really had to fight for the criminal justice component uh, because what it ended up being is uh, just a money grab for individuals who have not been adversely affected by marijuana or, or their families or incarcerated for it uh, or significant fines for it. Uh, being able to enter the, the, this huge marijuana market and make money off something that we've been incarcerated for, uh, for, for years um, without, but without a, 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 a automatic expungements uh, or, or uh, not just decriminalization of a small amount, but you know, we need to make sure that, it, that uh, that just because you don't have, say, a license to sell it and then you get caught with it, that there's still criminal prosecutions for marijuana. It needs to be decriminalized altogether. Uh, and, you know, and, and of course, that would affect the bottom line of s some of those who enter the industry um, legally, but that's not the point. You know, the point is really just to, 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 to ensure that we aren't continually disproportionately uh, enforced and prosecuted uh, for, 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 for drug use, you know, marijuana and other drugs as well. Okay, uh, Representative Reynolds, you have any thoughts on that? I, I, I echo the sentiment of my colleagues. Uh, when you look at the numbers, there are so many people incarcerated on low level drug offenses. That is, it, that, that is, that is really fundamentally wrong. There are so many people that uh, are, are not bad, heinous people that are committing felonies. But again, our, our jails, our prisons, and then if they do get in trouble later on in life, they have more strikes against them. So we really need to reform. Uh, we really need to change this. I believe that there should be more uh, constitutional amendments where we put it on the ballot for a referendum to let the people decide. Because what I've seen is a lot of times legislators will get in the way uh, with their own quote unquote morality and, 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 and especially from the Christian right. That's what I've, I've experienced in Texas. So we don't let the people decide. They don't wanna put it on a ballot because they know if they did, it would pass overwhelmingly. So they, they restrict that ability uh, in, a, in, a, in a democratic republic by not allowing the people, the citizens to vote. So I, I agree with my colleagues and we need to continue to educate people so they can be engaged and empowered and remember, elections matter. At the end of the day, elected officials are accountable to the people. The people need to exercise their voice and vote people that reflect their values. Thank you, thank you. Let me just ask a question from the Q&A. Uh, and let's see, the question is, how do we hold police officers punitively accountable uh, for money? Uh, I think what they're talking about is, well, even if you win a judgment, I think uh, one of our member panel members said he got a judgment of $38 million, but the police officer didn't pay a dime. Uh, when there is a settlement 
in favor of the plan of the taxpayers are on the hook for millions. As long as the PAC taxpayers are footing the bill, there's no incentive for rogue officers to stop egregarious misconduct. How do we, is there something we can do? And this can be for anyone, from anyone on the panel. Well, I'll jump in really quickly. I do think, though, there is a certain incentive for local governments and state government to um, intervene or at least to um, have at least those who are managing that department to intervene, because even if the officers themselves are not liable, uh, it, it greatly impacts, I think, how their departments will end up being funded. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there, but I, I feel like if we made them liable, uh, what are they going to give you? You know, like... <laughs> Mm -hmm. what, what do they actually financially have? They can in any way try and um, make, you can't even make the family whole over a death, but to at least give the family some level of comfort. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, anyone else? Anyone else? Well, I, I, I will just say we've been debating that sort of issue in, in the General Assembly with the Qualified immunity, immunity Bill and it had been refashioned by a delegate born, making it the, um, basically the locality is liable because the reality is police officers don't have $30 million. It's rare if they do to, to meet a judgment. Um, but I think the ultimate goal is to prevent incidents where families have to sue. And so I think with more accountability from localities that, that may be a way to, to actually cur curtail these, these type of cases so that we're having officers complying with their, their training and, um, you know, and cut down on it. But that's something that certainly, uh, certainly legislators are trying to figure out how, how to do. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah, I, I, I can't agree with uh, a legislative solution of uh, at least making uh, a police offer, officer partially liable or have to pay some penalty uh, if, if they are, are found guilty uh, or if they reach a civil settlement of, you know, of, over a certain amount of, uh, of money. Um, of course, you'd hear a lot, a lot of pushback, most spe specifically, and this is another, another issue that we have to tackle, it's for police unions. They're really strong. Um, and a lot of times uh, it's, it's tough to effectuate any change with you know, unless legislators are willing to go against police unions. Um, <clears throat> be, and so, so it's, an, it's an uncomfortable conversation with many legislators because sometimes the police un uh, unions are, um, are, are donors to, to our campaigns. Uh, in some instances, their endorsement helps us get elected. Uh, and in a lot of instances, they are our protection uh, as we move about uh, serving our community, you know, so it, it's a very, uh, very, very fine, tight line, tight rope, uh, as, as when, when we start making police officers more accountable, but it's something that as a legislator, you have to, you have to show some bravery um, and, and, and just understand that there are certain steps that we have to take in order to remedy um, just, just the years of, of structural inequity uh, that exists. Thank you so much. And let me say this, as you know, I grew up uh, in the church and I still remember one of the sermons they would say is that sorrow comes at night, but joy comes in the morning. And, you know, when the, we had the George Floyd verdict, many people in the media seem to say, well, it's morning in America. I don't think it's morning yet. But when I hear from legislators like yourselves, and I say this with tears in my eyes, I feel hope uh, when I see that your determination, your steel, and your sense of urgency, I have hope. So it's not morning yet, but I think we're at the point where you can just sort of see the light coming over the horizon. Uh, with that, I want to thank uh, my distinguished panel for your, 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 your wisdom, for your passion, and your continued service and to say, you know, uh, onward till morning, onward till morning. And, and with that, um, let me turn uh, the podium back to our conveners uh, who I believe have further elements of the program. And I'll give you a round of applause. Thank you. Thank Pleasure you. Pleasure to serve with you all. God bless Thank you. you.
God bless you. So we're turning it back to our conveners. Thank you all so very much for being with us tonight for a most informative panel. Um, we now want to turn our attention to hearing from Mr. Jacob Blake Sr. You've given such phenomenal insights and information from the community and family experience um, to hearing the law school and the law scholar response to now hearing of all of the wonderful work that's taking place um, by our by our state legislators across the country. And what I would love to do now is open the floor. Mr. Blake, I'm going to stop talking. We had a very wonderful conversation and he has some insights and I'd just love for us to benefit from his wisdom. His son was a survivor. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm humbled and uh, so thankful to be surrounded by so many great law minds and political uh, opinions. Uh, mine is very simple. Um, we have to stop uh, the police brutality, the hatred, um, the racism that shows up in our communities. Our young people are, uh, scared of the police the seven and eight and nine and ten year old they're scared of the police they don't feel like they can go to the police and receive help or or service um that's the big that's a big problem and we're tired of being treated like animals because we are brown and black we we, we have to be treated inhuman that's, that's not what it's about. It's about, we're a part of humanity. My son was a human being. George Floyd was a human being. Rihanna Taylor was a human being. Why do we get treated in, in a certain manner with these two systems of justice that do us no justice? We're asking not to abolish the total thought of the police, we ask that the system that they're on that is broken be abolished. And we, we become honest with ourselves and, and partake in abolishing what has been killing us. We have to all unite to change what is being done to us. And it's an assist, it's, it's being done at such a, a fast rate that we can't even, we're, we're losing count. We're losing count. We cannot lose count. It's been 400 years or, or better. And we got some more years to put into this. My father was a part of the civil, mar civil rights marches. He marched from, what is it, Selma? Selma, Selma to Montgomery. Montgomery. Little giant went over that bridge. They, they fought, they faced those dogs and those, those those beatings because they knew there was better. Medgar Evers died in his driveway with his babies coming outside and his wife. Just so, and we're still up against voter right acts and it's 2021. We have to take hold. As black fathers, Black men, black women, black mothers, we must all unite and understand that wrong is wrong and enough is enough. Once again, thank you so much for you all letting me speak. Um, let's show some love and unity and get this thing together. Thank you very much. And now you heard from Jacob senior, the father, Mr. Blake, we had the opportunity to have a wonderful conversation. And if you could just share with us how things are coming along um, with, with your, your son right now in terms of recovering, he lived through seven gunshot wounds. So what man intended for evil, God definitely worked out for our good. So I'm going to ask 
Mr. Blake Sr. to just come on and give us an update on how well Jacob Blake Sr. is doing. And I will ask um, Professor Jones for a closing comment and we will go from there. Mr. Blake? Yes, I'm sorry, I lost Pete for a second. Uh, Jacob is doing much better. His birthday is tomorrow and I'll be spending the day with my son the way I spent my birthday with him. We'll be joking and laughing and hopefully he'll have a good day. We certainly all pray that and we extend our love and well wishes to your family. And I will ask Professor Jones, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our panelists for participating. But Professor Jones, could you leave us with a few thoughts before we close out this program? We asked him, Mr. Blake, if he would be one of our moderators, but he <laughs> could easily filled an hour himself. And I appreciate you for all the things that you've done. Please go ahead and ask away or close us out here. Well, I just want to begin by saying that this is a, an incredible presentation. And I think that uh, what this should do, it should not just make us think, it should make us, this is a call to action. Uh, this is a call that all of us find a way to contribute. There's a, a, a congressman who said, John Lewis, find a way to get in the way. We have a systemic problem and we have to find a way to get in the way to disrupt the brutality and racism. Um, I think that we should not, uh, not, not disguise the fact that we have a difficult struggle ahead. The George Floyd verdict was a great step forward, but it's only a step. We still have a journey of a thousand miles before we can dismantle the systemic problem. But I just wanna say this, I don't wanna speak long. I just wanna say this, and this is from uh, 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 W.B. Du Bois. He says, and this will be my closing remark, truth forever on the scaffold wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown. Standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. Thank you all, good night. Thank you all for being with us. And with that, we bid you good night. We really appreciate you for taking part in such an informative and needed discussion. So we ask the question, where are we a year after the death of George Floyd and so many others um, encountering police brutality? We're grateful for the survival of Jacob Blake Jr extraordinarily grateful for Jacob Blake Sr. being here, as well as our legislators, my home legislator out of Virginia, um, the majority leader in the Virginia State House, um, our vice chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus, Ron Reynolds. This has been an extraordinary program um, representing the great state of Tennessee. We've got Ramesh Akberry, the great senator who replaced um, a legend, Senator Lois DeBerry out of Memphis, Tennessee. We're just extraordinarily grateful for my law school classmate, Oliver Gilbert, the vice chairman of the Miami-Dade County Commission and Councilman Steve Pres um, Hockaday, Council President Hockaday out of Plainfield, New Jersey. Um, just to mention a few, we have a profound debt of gratitude to Professor D. Marvin Jones out of the University of Miami School of Law and Chris Lomax out of Jones Day who would have had the government actually prosecuted George Zimmerman for the death of Trayvon Martin, set first chair, as one of our youngest assistant United States attorneys in modern history. And naturally, so all of the phenomenal lawyers, we're so grateful, B. Ivory. Thank you for being with us, Lee Merritt. Thank you, Jay Wendell Gordon, for being with us. Judge Faith Johnson, profound debt of gratitude to you for everything that you've done. And I would be remiss if we did not thank Joyette Holmes out of Georgia for the great work that she's done, the prosecution, for the death of Ahmad Aubrey. So to all we bid good night and say thank you so much. Continue in the fight. Good evening. <laughs>